when the building started, Rich and I was just so excited. But then it became apparent just how much work there was to be done. I mean, we would go down there and take a look after it had been going for a couple of weeks and we'd expect to see something different, but there wasn't. It still looked the same. I mean, builders were there, they were doing things, but they were doing surveys so they could walk to the next room. They were testing the concrete to make sure this bit of concrete wasn't going to fall down. And... Yeah, when we first started, the boys were working in a small skate park, uh, taking down a ceiling, and the ceiling collapsed on them. It was unexpected. But it's just, uh, that's how dangerous this site is. There's dangers all over. The building was still the soggy mess it was before they'd started. And I think at that point, me and Rick really realised that this is a big, big project. It's going to take a lot of time before we're in there building ramps. The building's been laying 18 years dormant um, and we're uncovering lots of areas and we're potentially not going to find issues until we've started more of the uncovering works. The whole building is under sea level and the bottom floor is flooded. Somehow this level had been quite high so there was like two feet of water but we couldn't figure out where it was coming from. Uh, our initial concerns about the finishes and the amount of water that was penetrating the structure have proved to some extent to be valid. The only problem is that now we've found even more water getting into the old pool tank. Uh, at the moment it's not known where that's coming from. So trying to locate these leaks as well is, is a task. Uh, water travels, it may be dripping four metres away from where it's coming in. It would appear that it may be coming from the basement which is permanently flooded. Uh, and being permanently pumped. Yeah, there is, uh, there is worries, but hopefully we can solve all that and get over it. Me and Rick were still trying to plan how we're going to put ramps in here. To deal with the building side of things was, was important, but it was very hard for us not knowing how the building was going to be finished. We got peers from 9C Ramps in to, to design and build the ramps for us. And this guy was a BMX and skated a bit, so we knew he was a good guy. Starting out, obviously, that will be uh, doing the concept design um, for the, the skate park layout itself. Uh, moving on from that, myself and, and the team at 9C will be detail designing, machining, assembling, uh, and then obviously installing the skate park itself. Overall responsibility for the whole thing, basically. And he CNCs all the ramps together. We intensively use the CNC machine to make the parts uh, for the skate park. Unfortunately, in some ways, it doesn't actually make the skate park. Um, it only makes the parts for it. So he needed to know exactly what the floor was going to be, the dimensions of this swimming pool that we're going to put the bowl in. This particular project, what we've got to do is sequence everything very carefully. All of the modules need to arrive on site and go through the hatch in the sequence that they'll be installed. There's not a lot of space within the building itself once all the ramps are in there. And we couldn't get that information. We was asking the builders, what's this going to be? What's this measurement? What's the floor? And at that point, they couldn't give us an answer because they were still away, away from knowing that. They had many other things to do before they even got to the floor. Yeah, it's a bit of worry with the, the concrete floor in that we can't finish the ramp design. We've got a good concept. But obviously the depth of the floor really, really affects the kind of ramps you can build and the decks that go off the side of the ramps. The unforeseen under there have already flagged up that we've got big concrete, reinforced slabs, potentially many to be broken out, which we hadn't envisaged. We've also got stormwater laying in there up to about 600 million depth. Which is posing quite a lot of problems both logistically and financially for the, the project as a whole. We're going to pump it out and hopefully it doesn't come back. My gut feeling is that it will come back. But once we've got that sorted, it should make for a really interesting design with the uh, level split throughout the park. We can do anything. We can make any ramps until we knew the depth of this end of the pool. We've ordered the wood, which takes three months to arrive in anticipation of the design being finalised. But it's a bit of a worry at the moment that, you know, five months before we're due to open, we don't have a final ramp plan. I remember walking underneath into the swimming pool with piers with a torch trying to figure out what was the deep end and what was the shallow end in the pitch black and got water up to our knees. And then we was like, man, there's a lot of water in here. How are we going to put ramps in a swimming pool that is still half full with dirt and water? Obviously, what we're doing is putting a, a wooden structure within the pool itself. Whilst you can make boats out of wood, this isn't a boat, it's a skate park, and it's not designed to float. As he's an engineer, he saw problems that 
Rick and I hadn't seen. So he was, he was a very angry man that day, I remember. The water has to go, uh, and it's got to go now. Where it's coming from, no one knows. Where it's going to at the moment is nowhere fast, which obviously poses a fairly major problem uh, overall. And I remember it being quite funny, just how many problems he found. He was, you know, he was pointing at this going, why have the builders done this? Why have they done this? And... But if we're going to put this, this street stuff through here, yeah. then that really needs to, need to move. Yeah, or It pay. needs to move. Yeah. Imagine we've got to build the floor up, like six inches tall. This should be here. I've got to put a ramp here. How can I put a ramp here if this has been done by the builders? The problem is, Mark, is that if, they, if someone had sorted all this stuff out, then the council would have had the money to pay for the floor. Oh, exactly. There was so much conflict between yeah, yeah, what the builders were doing to get the building up to scratch and what he needed from them to put ramps in. Probably more that and get a wall ride out. And it did dawn on us. It was just like, oh, wow, there are there are some more problems here than what we first realised. However many, you know, one, two, probably three, four, five plugs, right? There's only one in the cafe. See where the door is? Yeah. In the cafe. Yeah. And it doesn't need to be any here, but you probably need ten in there. Yeah, there's fucking loads upstairs as well. Yeah, I know, all the way around, and it doesn't need any. Do we know what's happening with all these pillars as well? Because that, I mean, but as that. angry as he was, it was it was so good to see him because you could tell he was so passionate about this being the right way, and we knew he was like the right guy for the job because he just knew that that needed to be like this and this needed to be like that. The we problem is that it needs to be dry. Yeah. Obviously, at the moment, it looks like you put some bungs in the pipe. Yep. But they're spraying like yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, like half a yeah, meter. Yeah, the idea, since we've been here, yeah. that when we exposed that, that water was 130 mil above the concrete plinth. Yeah. It's a bit worrying. Everything kind of didn't quite go to plan. It's sort of 16 hours in today, and it's, it's kind of gone from bad to worse, really. And then we found that the water hasn't been fixed. No one's told us about it. When we, and then we pump it out, and then it, when we turn the pumps off and it comes back in again, yeah. it comes into that point. It doesn't ever rise above that. Sure. We thought we were doing quite well and are spending money on, on fitting the park out literally next month. And yet there's all these problems that are unresolved and we're behind schedule. Yeah. If that water's going to rise to above the concrete glimpse, then it's going to start affecting It needs to be dry. Yeah, there's some real, real things that are, that are not right there. It's, it's, it's definitely concerning. You know, it, these are, it, it can be mitigated, it will cost money, but, you know, it, it, we can get over it. So I need someone to um, grab the ball by the horns and deal with the problem, preferably the architect, since one would hope they've got a good oversight on the project as a whole. And in reality, it's about 1,800, so we've already lost another 200 mil there. But at the moment, it would seem like the, the main contractor's being left to deal with that, with, with um, a, a lack of direction and... They've ordered and paid for a railing that's going to stick out all over the skate park, which is literally lethal. People can take themselves down. There's also water pipes in the wrong place and holes drilled in the wrong place. And it really kind of grasps us today that we're not in control of this project and we're relying on other people that, that don't care about it as much as we are. There was, there was at first maybe a bit of conflict. You'd never stop the no. water completely, the damp is completely. No, 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 you, no. You'd, you'd reduce it, but you wouldn't. Yeah, no, it's got to be. Not, not with the money that's available anyway. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's definitely concerning. Yeah, not good. After Mark got world number three in Australia, he, he, he was ill. And he got Lyme disease. And in Bexhill, there wasn't really a racing left the track. And by that time I'd started university and I'd been travelling. I found myself not really having much to do. He was at home and he was not at all well, but as he improved, I said, well, you've got to get a job of some sort. Basically, quit college and spent all day at the woods digging jumps. The strongest scene around Bexhill was always the Sydney Woods Trails. And when I got back to Bexhill, the only scene left was trails and street riding. I used to bunk off school to go up there and dig. I remember there was people up there like Ricky Bollington and Tom Hooper and some really cool locals. 
yeah, definitely got fond memories of, of growing up with yeah, a lot of my friends all testing yourself and scaring yourself and crashing. As a kid witnessing it, I didn't really realise how good it was until later on in life. All day up there building jumps, riding jumps, building trails, riding trails. Instead of racing, it was all the fun of racing without the pedalling. So there'd always be people down there racing or doing whatever they did, gay practice or whatever, and then they'd always come nibbling up. You could do what you wanted down there, you could make what you want, and, and it got a lot of businesses as well back then. It does now, but there was an era down there where it was, you know, every weekend pros were turning up to ride our woods, and it was just amazing. Yeah, everyone sort of did their bit, you know, and then, like, the kids that didn't even dig would send them down to the shop and, like, you know, just get the ice poles or whatever. They made the scene. As like a, as a group of riders and stuff. Here and stuff, he was definitely an influence on some of the, the, the scene. It was good to have people like that here. I mean, it's just all about having fun, really, on your bikes and, and enjoying the stuff that you've built. When you when you create something off your own back, you start building lines, and your mind's always ticking over, creating. Oh, what could I do here now on my bike? And that was where I found myself for the next four to five years, really. He was like 18 and bumming around, and really wanted him to do something. I said, well, you've got to get a job of some sort. I was at the age where I had to make some money, actually had to pay my way. It's not a free ride in my house. I said, <laughs> you, you, you either work or you go. I ended up getting a rubbish job in an insurance company. Hated it. Absolutely hated it. But he was also doing magazine work at the same time with Richard. And I got this random phone call from a new magazine. It's actually a surf publisher, and they wanted to start a BMX title and basically offered me a job after a, after a few weeks or months of talking as their main senior photographer and writer. And I was getting paid like three or four thousand pounds a month, which was crazy. I was going to all kinds of big contests all around the world. So I was meeting everyone and, and hanging out and we were testing products as well. So with all these kids riding and this strong scene in Becks Hill, there wasn't really a shop to support it. And I just thought, we need stuff. I need to buy stuff for my bike. Stuff breaks all the time and we need bits and we couldn't get it. But yeah, it was hilarious. We'd go out and test all these products and write about them. We just sent boxes of stuff. So I had a relationship with all the distributors and brands. Like mail order and internet didn't really exist then. There's not a decent bloody BMX shop. There isn't one. Anywhere in the country we've been to, have they found a shop? We needed to get parts and there wasn't anywhere to get them. We needed a local shop and that's what the shop was born out of, just a need to keep the scene going, the love of what we do going. It was just rad that there was a beer egg shop. It didn't matter what they sold, we would have bought it, I think, just to support it. By people that rode and, and that, that cared, so it was going to be good. And everyone was super excited. I think I was like 15. So at the time, yes, yeah, fairly young. March the 8th, 2003, when we opened the doors. None other than Keith Dooley, the local BMX track legend, opened the shop for us. I remember rocking up to the first shop and no one knowing me. <laughs> I remember that totally. And on the first day, I remember Josh yeah. Heritage came in. And he was our first customer. Sauce. And I was like, sauce. I thought it was like spelt tom uh, tomato sauce. <laughs> And he was this ratty little annoying kid that would come in every day after school and just annoy us and torment us. Like a fucking dipping sauce, not the sauce for your BMX product. 
dad's idea was to call it Moore's Bike, <laughs> which we like, we were like, no way. So Mark came up, Mark came up with the name of Source. We got what little money we had together. We'd spent it all on stock to fill out this impossibly small shop just on a side street in, in Bexhill, our hometown. Just basically, we just sat in a pub and talked about like everything we knew and just coming up with like a concept for a cool BMX and skate shop. Like you'd go in and if you were wearing the wrong thing, you'd get ripped, whatever. Like, but it was all part of like your attraction towards it. It kept you coming back for more. On the first day, Fids came in. He bought some grips. I was like, oh, you can have them for a fiver. It shows how much business knowledge I had. He stood up and said, no, I'll pay the full amount. <laughs> Ideas and progress never amount to anything without support from your friends and the scene. My plan was to start applying for jobs in London, like all my friends did, but I just started hanging out in the shop all day long, and that's, that's all I did. So I was kind of working for nothing for six months and just loving it and watching it grow. So many locals came in and supported the shop, so many faces and people we had ridden with over the years. At that sort of juncture, I thought, you know what, I think, I think it's going to be all right. But you can see that they, they work hard for it, so it's not like they just sit around drink tea and, and don't do anything. We just ended up sitting in the pub taking orders and then if a customer would come along we'd walk over and that's like seriously it was the best summer ever. And with the scene growing and with the riders being able to get the parts they need it just pushed on and on. I knew somebody who, who built websites so I got him to build us a source website and I went back to Ride Magazine and we got discount ads. And it made us realise that the bigger the scene the better the shop. Online shopping wasn't even a word back then. It was obvious that websites were the future of, of retail. It was just so obvious to me. And from that, we, we started supporting local events, trying to grow the amount of people that rode BMX. It just progressed. It just, just, just grew and grew. We've got the instruction to lower the 70% uh, of the, the main concrete plank floor in the what was the original bars. Now we're taking those out because the source want to use that sunken area of the pool for their, their ramps, gives them you know higher jump capacity. We have to form a concrete wall all the way along this section here so that we've got a bearing point for when they lower down. We're well on the way with that. It's quite a task really. It's very, very labour intensive. I would imagine we're about another two weeks off completing that area. The retail area is pretty much well into the second fixed stages. Doors are going on, diamondry is going on, plasterboard's been done, the plasterers are coming in later on this week and we're going to be working alongside the source because they're going to start wanting to fit out those areas. And we just work together with them to make sure that we can um, meet a programme that's agreeable to everyone in that area. We were due to get the keys at the start of September and it's now, you know, it's now the 10th of September and we're not at least another two weeks away and probably four weeks away from big parts of it. So as time goes on, we're really kind of honing in on the budget and just looking at every penny we spend. I mean, we're putting about 250,000 of our own money on top of the actual build cost, which is separate. Uh, we've obviously been working on the design of our shop fit and ramps for so long now, and it's, it's, it's a bit worrying looking at something so new going into such an old building and how, how haggard it is really. I think people might be expecting something new and shiny and, and it, it definitely isn't that. Six weeks have passed since we were measuring up on site before the floor removal. In that time we've been able to progress the uh, concept design to a point there's still some uncertainty from the floor levels um, between the floor that's being lowered and the pre-existing floor level. But during that time period, we've obviously um, been able to start detailed design, sheening and assembly of some of the modular elements of the skate park. The next main phase on the project is to actually get the modules on site and, and obviously begin the installation process. So there was always a rumour that underneath the, the sort of glass pyramid on the seafront, there was a bowl that was there from the 70s. No one really believed it was there. But during the build, we had to take the floor up in the small pool and it turned out that it was actually true and there was a bolt. So we, we took the opportunity, it was slightly shady, where we could actually physically skate or ride that pool. It was good just to get in there and have a skate about and just to say we skated that pool. I mean, no one had for 30 years and not many people 30 years ago even skated it. So 
it was it was nice to get in there and have a little shred but um yeah definitely no regrets about covering it up After 18 months or so, it became quite apparent that we'd, we'd run out of space in our tiny little shop on a side street at Bexhill. We made the bold move of about five doors down, which is a, a much bigger shop. So this was the first shop fit we had that actually had a deadline. And I remember our friends just pitching in from the scene. I know Fids was a carpenter, so he was in Beard Encounters with Ben. That's just part of BMX, isn't it? Like, if you're, if you're into BMX, then, then uh, and you like trails, whatever, then you go off and build your own fun. We had a welder in there. We had Dan Pierce, who was in there, who was a plumber. Again, just building skate racks and building counters, laying floors. Everyone jumped in to open the much larger shop. I remember it being pretty stressful at the time, but we did it. The second shop was opened by the local mayor. For some reason, we decided to dress up like superheroes. Walked around Bexhill Town with boards, letting people know that the source had just reopened. The second shop being bigger allowed us to start employing our friends, the guys from the scene. The first people were Ricky, and he was just because he was hanging out in the shop and we got him to build a wheel. Second was Jamie, and, and that was because he was a postman, so finished work at midday. And we just got him to pack boxes because, because he was a postman. We thought he'd be good at it. Their sales have started selling online, so they needed help with packing up pairs of shoes and stuff. And I just ended up naturally lending a hand. Shop kept distracting us from doing mail order. I just went out the back and got some shoes. And then they were like, what, what are you doing? And I said, I don't know. But I'm giving this person some shoes. And they were like, OK, cool. They showed me how to do the till. And then it just, it was like, well, can you do next Saturday, actually? We entered a business award and won that. So by 2005, I was seeing the potential of the business. It had doubled in size in its first year and then doubled again. The second shop was the realisation that there was a family behind the source. People were really into it and they were into the idea of having a shop, having a scene and a place to meet before they went riding. Be hanging out after work and then you go ride. Yeah, you go ride at the woods. We even managed to get a little mini ramp in the garden which the neighbours absolutely hated. It was the shoddiest ramp. I think we got a letter from the landlord in the end. The backyard probably wasn't more than 16 feet square, it was tiny. It was just ghetto, but it, but no one else could be bothered. You know, like, we, we all could do it, but they actually did it. Pros came to that second shop. Corey Martinez came over and, and Dan Lacey was there, but Dan Lacey was really young, and they're all riding this ramp. I guess that was the first point the source started to get some attention. By 2006, we had, a, like, a lock-up warehouse in Hastings. Oh, our two biggest suppliers by that point were there. It just made sense for us to be in Hastings. The scene was also there. There was more things to riding Hastings. And us that rode were in Hastings most of the time riding. And the guys who rode in Hastings had to travel to Bexhill. So it made perfect sense to move to Hastings. Yeah, you know, like it was just crazy running. Because they had their shop in Bexhill, then they went to the high street in Hastings, which is nuts. It was our third horrific ordeal at fitting out a shop against the clock. Half our customers come and helped. And we were there till four or five in the morning. Yeah, that, that shop here was mental. Again, everyone pitched in. Yeah, everyone's so good like that. Like, we owe them a lot. Mental all-nighters, which we'd sort of become accustomed to by now. The shop was a, a great location right on the high street. Yeah, it was minging. It was horrific. It was disgusting. But we'd outgrown it almost instantly by the time we moved in. Yeah, it was good times looking back at it. It was hard. And when we opened, we had a band playing on top of the roof, which sort of freaked out the residents of Hastings when we first got there. It's never ending, isn't it? There's always something crazy going on. It was a place to hang out, it was a place for people to come. We finally cemented a team and started publicising. The first DVD came out called Deal With It.
Come out of front of Rick. And that was premiered at the local nightclub called The Brass Monkey. And it was this full carnage. Everyone turned up in fancy dress and the whole scene got together, watched this video where everyone was in. And it was just the best time. And it, it made you realise why you were doing it.